on May 7th, 1931. The busy streets of Manhattan, New York, were filled with gunfire. There was a manhunt. They were chasing a man named Francis Crowley, or they nicknamed him Two Gun Crowley because he used two guns. They were surrounding his apartment. They were cutting holes in his apartment door, uh, in his apartment ceiling, and th throwing in tear gas in order to smoke him out. But the manhunt went on for two hours until he was finally wounded and later captured. This man was a cop killer. Just some time before that, he was sitting in his car with his girlfriend as a police officer approached his car asking for his license. And instead of giving him a license, he shot him. And after wounding him, he got out of the car and shot him as he was laying there on the floor. And then he wounded another officer after that. He escaped, and that's when the manhunt began. Sometime before that, Tugan Crowley was sitting in a car with his friend. His friend had a girl in the car. She refused to be with him, so he shot her. Tugan Crowley helped him hide the body in the river. This man was a murderer, and after he was caught, the police officer, the main commissioner, he said that he will kill at the drop of a feather. This guy did not hesitate to murder, to take life. Just imagine somebody sitting next to you right now that he didn't hesitate to take somebody's life. He was later then put on death row and he was executed. Now my question to you guys is, and I want an answer is, was justice served? Yes or no? Was justice served? He took the lives of many people and then his life was later, ta later taken. Was justice served, guys? Okay. Now, my question is, and I agree that justice was served, but how did Tugan Crowley see his own self? You guys ever think about that? And there would be no way that we would know how he seen himself unless he wrote a note before he got captured. I'm assuming he thought he was going to die as he was laying there bleeding he actually wrote a note that they found in his coat later. And this is what the note said. It said, under my coat is a weary heart, but a kind one, one that would do nobody harm. Can you guys, can you guys just taste the irony? This man just killed another man, just murdered him. And here he's saying, my heart is a weary heart, but a kind one, one that would do nobody harm. That's outrageous, guys. That's literally, it's, if you kind of think of it, it's kind of like a mental disorder. And we're going to come back to Tugun Crowley. But before we move on, I want to ask you, does the way he felt about his own self, does that change the requirement of justice, right? He killed somebody, he deserves to be executed. But the way he's seen himself, the way he felt about himself, does that change the requirement of justice? Yes or no? I want you guys to answer tonight. No. no. Okay, thank you, right? Because it would be ridiculous if he comes to the judge and says, you know what, judge, I know I killed these people, but I feel like I have a kind heart that would do nobody harm. And the just, judge says, oh, really? Is that how you feel? Okay, well, well, then case dismissed. Why didn't the other people say that? <laughs> no, guys, it doesn't work like that. What he did deserves justice and he received it. So we're going to come back to him. But right now, let's open up our word, the word of God, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. That's going to be our base text for tonight. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. It's at the end of the Bible, like the very end. Yeah, if you see the maps, you've gone too far. Turn around and go back. Uh, so, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. And this is John, and the book of Revelation is a series of visions that Apostle John seen at the end of his life. Although the apostles were already dead at this point, he was an old man, he's on, on an island in kind of prison, and he sees these visions. And this is at the end of his visions, and this is what he sees. He says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. 
Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what he had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to what they had done. Then, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Honestly, guys, this is a difficult topic. And I'd appreciate it that you guys would just pray for me during the sermon because it's, it's a lot, okay? So um, just to kind of go through this, uh, the final judgment in order to understand more what the final judgment is, because this series is We Believe. We want you guys to know what we believe as Christians, because if somebody comes up to you and asks you, you know, well, what do you believe in the final judgment? Can you honestly give them a full, uh, complete answer that would make sense to them, an answer that would glorify God? I don't know, but hopefully after tonight, you guys will be able to, okay? So the first thing, that we see, and I want to clarify this right now, is uh, this passage, it talks about the great white throne. And the people who study the Bible, theologians, they've, they've debated ever since Revelations was written. They didn't know, you know, they debated whether there's two different thrones, whether there's a throne for unbelievers and there's a throne for believers. Some say there's one great white throne, some say there's two different thrones. There is no, like, consensus but according to this passage, what I see is that there is one throne. But honestly, that doesn't really matter as much as the fact that everyone's going to be judged. And everyone agrees on that. So whether there's one throne or two thrones, it doesn't really matter because the point is everybody will be judged. So as we go into the final judgment, in order to understand more about it, we're going to, you guys know the five W's? The five, que five questions that start with W's, who, what, when, where, why, I think those are the five W's. So we're going to look at the five W's of the final judgment so that we can be able to know what we truly believe about the final judgment. First W is where. Where is the final judgment? Answer, it's before the great white throne. It's kind of simple. White means no corruption. White means pure. That means you can't bribe God. You can't get away. There's no favoritism. It's pure. It's straight up. That's it. Next W, when. When will the, great, when will the final judgment happen? We know if we read Revelations, it happens after Christ steps into this world. Christ steps in, kills all evil, kills Satan, destroys him, takes him captive. He caught evil, but he hasn't punished it yet. So it's this transition between these two ages. It's a transition from this time, from this evil, problematic age, to a good and perfect age. Think of it, uh, think of it for example, like uh, Tugan Crowley, right? He murdered somebody and he got caught, but they didn't punish him yet. And it's that transition. That's exactly what the final judgment is. It's a doorway from one age into another. That's what the final judgment is, and it's a very necessary doorway. Who? Third question. And for this question, there's two questions. First one is who will be judged, and the second one is who will judge. First one, who will be judged. And I do want to clarify this. I want to explain this before we go in. The word judged in the Bible, it's used in two different ways. Do you guys know that before? It's used in two different ways. In one way, it's used to mean that uh, like examined, looked over. You guys know those, you know, pie eating contests or whatever they have? Though, there's judges sitting there. They don't condemn people. They don't execute people. I hope not. Nobody would be part of those pie competitions. They just evaluate. They examine. That's the first type of judgment. The second type of judgment is, means condemned. Actually proclaiming someone as guilty, saying, hey, you murdered someone. This is what you're, you will receive. Okay? So as you read your Bibles, make sure you don't get confused and keep in mind that the Bible uses that word judged in two different ways. So back to that question is who will be judged? The answer is everyone, unbelievers and believers. Romans talks about this. I think it's Romans, let me flip my page, Romans chapter 2 verses 5 through 10. It says, Paul says, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed, 
he will give to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, that's one group, he will give eternal life. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Okay? Both people will stand before God. Both groups of people will be examined by God. So what does this mean to us? That means every single person sitting here, whether you are a believer in God, whether or not you have trusted in Jesus Christ, guys, we will all stand before God and our lives will be examined to the very last detail. Romans chapter, sorry, Revelations 20 verse 15 says, and if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That means everybody's names are examined whether or not they're in the book of life. So everybody will be judged. But what's also interesting is not only will angels and unbelievers be judged, sorry, not only, I just stole my thunder, uh, not only unbelievers and believers will be judged, but angels also will be judged. The Bible doesn't talk much about it, but I want to put it out there because we want to know what we believe. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Everybody's going to be judged. Next question is, who will be judged? And do you guys know the answer to this? Come on, it's, it's like the title of the sermon. Who will judge? Say his name. Who will judge the universe? God, Jesus. There you go, guys. Jesus, judge Jesus, will judge the world. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says, Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. Acts chapter 10, verse 24. Christ is appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Jesus Christ will sit on that throne and judge the entire universe. But there's also a, a catch to that. The Bible also says that saints, the people who have believed in God, will also judge the world. 2 Corinthians, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? So if you guys believe in Jesus Christ today, you also will judge the world. The Bible doesn't talk much about it, so I can't, I'm not going to try making something up. But what we do know is somehow we're going to take part in this process of judging the world at the end of the age. And what's interesting is what this tells us about the nature of God. Do you guys ever think about that? Like, what is this verse or what is this what's written in here? What does that tell us about the nature of God? The fact that he lets us judge the world tells us that our God is not this power-hungry God that just, you know, saves people and just uses them as little slaves, just feeding them every now and then. Instead, our God is a loving Father who says, you know what, here, I entrust you guys, I delegate, I give you guys power and authority also in order to bring justice into the world. He not only saves us, but also uses us to bring justice into the world. Guys, that's awesome what God is doing. He's preparing for this, for us for that if you are a believer. That's the who. Next, what? What is the final judgment? And there's two parts to the final judgment. You guys remember we read Revelation chapter 20? Everyone standing before the great white throne? And in there it mentions the book of life on one hand and then there's also books and the books were opened so verse 15 says the book of life and then verse 12 talks about uh and the books were opened and the judge and the dead were judged by what was written in the books there's two different stages to the final judgment what is it first stage is imagine every single soul that has ever lived every person in, in the universe all your ancestors, all your children, all the popular people, all the people that died without anyone ever knowing them, every single soul, soul standing before God's white throne, and there's a huge line. And the person comes up, and then there's the book of life. And God says, is your name in the book of life? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ? Have you lived for Him? Has He paid for your sins? If yes please step into this category. If no, step into the other category. And everybody will go through this separation process. And God says that he will separate two groups of people. That's the first step, step 
of the final judgment. The second one is after that has been separated, each person will be looked over. Your entire life will be examined. My life will be examined. Everything I did from day zero will be examined. And then for those who have trusted in Christ, whose name are in the book of life, they will be rewarded. Those who have not trusted in Christ, but have lived self-seeking life, they will be punished. And what, what is amazing is that the Bible actually tells us that there will be different levels or different degrees of reward for those who have trusted in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 15. Let's open it, actually, because this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. So the second stage decides who get what, who, who gets what. First stage decides who goes where. Second one decides who gets what. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 15. Now, Paul is talking to Christians and he says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's saying, for those of you who are Christians, God has come in, here you are, and he has laid a foundation that is Jesus Christ. That's your cornerstone. Everything else you do from that, it's you building on top of this foundation. That's it. Jesus Christ is your foundation. It says, now, if, now he says, no one can lay another foundation. If you're Christ, that's it. That foundation is not going anywhere. You can't lay a different foundation. What is up to us is what we put on this foundation. Does that make sense, guys? And he says, now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become open or revealed, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what work each one of you has done, each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Guys, what this passage tells us is just because you're saved doesn't mean you don't worry about anything. Just because you're good with God, and that's amazing news. Don't get me wrong, guys. That's amazing. But just because you're saved doesn't mean that everything's going to be nice and dandy and you don't have to try Instead, this passage is saying, look, everything that you do, it's every action, every minute that you use of your life, it's you building on this foundation of Christ. And everything that you do, which is eternal, is like building out of gold and silver and precious stones. Everything that you do is like wasting time, living for yourself, selfishness, uh, trying to do your own will and not seeking God's good and not God's glory, not other people's good. It's like building out of hay and straw. And you know what? Hay is a lot lighter than gold. It's a lot easier to carry hay around. It's a lot easier to carry wood around than huge blocks of gold. But you know what? It says that when the day will reveal it. On the last day, judgment, when we, our lives will be examined, that examination will be like that fire that just sweeps through, through all the houses that we have built. And whatever you have done, guys, whatever I have done that has, that has not been for God's glory, for His eternal purposes, will just fade away. Have you guys ever worked on something for a long time? And then somebody comes up and just like destroys it. You know, like when you're a kid, you're building a little sand castle or something. And then a wave just comes through and, pfft, and you, I just wasted three hours building this thing. And I didn't think about the tide, <laughs> but the tide came through. You guys ever done that? Or you draw on something and it just gets messed up or your little sibling comes in and messes it up or your big sibling, usually big siblings were jerks. Uh, do you guys ever have that happen? And that's exactly how final judgment will be. If you are a believer, guys, everything that you have done is like your work of art. It's you building something. It's you creating something. And God will come through and He'll say, Okay, I have given you time. Now let's look what you have done eternally. And that fire will sweep through and it will eat up everything that is non-eternal. Guys, for me, this is motivating because I'm like, 
God, I just want to build out of gold. I want to build more out of more gold, out of more precious stones as much as possible. Forget that wood and that hay. I don't want that. I want gold, guys. And this tells us that there will be different levels, different degrees of reward in heaven. Guys, and you, I'm telling you, you want as big as of a reward in heaven as possible. You know why? Because you're going to be there forever. Trust me. You guys want to do that. So it's possible to be saved and to live a life that will, is completely wasted and you will suffer loss. That's what the Bible says. But you will be saved only as through fire. Beware, Christians. Beware. Live for the glory of God. The next thing and we're still on the what of the final judgment, is that there will be different rewards of punishment as well. Matthew chapter 11, verse 24 says, but I tell you, just, this is Jesus speaking, he says, but I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. What this means is that God is not just like this black and white, dumb little computer that says, oh, guilty, you know, moves you into a category and that's it. God is a very understanding God and He will know and He will tolerate some people more than others in the final judgment. So, it's true, guys. There will be degrees of punishment in hell as well. Now, you might be thinking, well, how is that fair? You know, how, how is that fair that one group of people gets rewarded, one people, group of people gets punished, while everyone's a sinner? If everyone did bad things, because we're all bad, I have sinned many times, how, why are you going to get rewarded for the good things you do and somebody else who also did some good things, but also some bad things and never trusted in Jesus, why are they going to get punished? I want, and guys, this is where the gospel comes in. The reality is all of our good cannot cover any evil. Think of it this way. If Tugan Crowley lived a perfect life all the way up to age 80, just like, you know, he's like the second, he's like Father Teresa, you know, just helping everybody out, doing everything good, and then on the last day, he just like kills somebody. Will the judge say, well, you know, Tugan Crowley, you've been, you've, you believe you have a good heart. That's the first one. Second one, you've been so good, so we're just going to let this one slip. Will that work? Guys, will that work in the court of law? No. Did you, do, did you murder this person? Yes. Guilty. Period. Closed. All the good that we do cannot cover even a single sin. Now, you might be thinking, well, how do we get saved then? Because I sure did a, a heck of a lot of sins. And the reality is, guys, the only way that we can escape judgment is if somebody pays for our sin. And the Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave up His only Son. God gave up His Son. Jesus did live the perfect life. And He died. He didn't deserve death. You guys understand that? He was condemned even though He didn't do anything evil. And when we believe in Him, when we trust in Him, He takes our sin upon Himself and He died with that sin. He took God's judgment. That is why when God will look at us, He will not see a single spot of sin if you have trusted in Him because all evil must be paid for. You guys understand that? God is just. He will pay for every single spot of evil. But with those who have trusted in Christ, guys, this means that when God looks at your sin and He says, the Father looks at your sin, He says, this must be paid for. And Jesus Christ will step in and He'll say, Father, Daddy, he, she cannot be punished for this because I already paid for it. I'm not asking you to just let it go and sweep it under the rug. No, it's obvious. Yes, let's admit it. They did evil, but I paid for it. There will be no hiding of sin on the final judgment. But Jesus Christ has paid for sins. And if you guys believe in him, if you accept Him, if you cast your sins upon Him and take His righteousness and follow Him with your lives, He has paid your sin. And on the last day, you're not going to need to be ashamed of your sin. But you will say, I, I can't say anything, God, about my sin. I have no excuse. All I have is Christ. 
He has paid for me, guys. And that is how God can be both just and yet merciful at the same time. That is the only way. And that is what is so beautiful about the gospel. Last question on final judgment. It's why. Why do we have the final judgment? And I want to tell you guys, it's not, to, it's not for God to figure out what happened. You know, it's not like final judgment comes and then God looks at the book. Well, you did what? <laughs> He's not going to do that. He's not going to be surprised by what, by what you did already. He knows everything. It's not for God to figure things out. Oh, well, I thought you were on my side. I guess not. God already knows everything. The final judgment will be to show the entire universe. It will be a proclamation to the entire world, to every being in the universe, to know that God is both just and holy and that God is both merciful and gracious. Do you guys make sense? It's, does that make sense? It's like that you're watching a show and you just see justice brought into the world and, and that's what that is. It's that finale, that grand finale at the end of this universe. That is what final judgment is. Another reason why we have final judgment is because we all have a sense of unsatisfied justice in this life. Let me explain. Do you guys ever ask yourself the question, um, why do bad things happen to good people? You guys ever, you guys ever think about that? Or why do good things happen to bad people? Like this person is bad. I, I mean, they're just sinning left and right. You know, they're doing all the bad stuff. And, and they're just living a great life. And then I can give you examples of people who have lived completely evil lives and then they died at old age, calm death, nothing, just smooth. And you're thinking, what the heck? Like, why? God, why? How is that fair? And you know, the reality is it's not fair in this life. We all have a, a sense of justice that must be satisfied. We all have a hunger for justice. And that is what the final judgment will be. On the last day, the final judgment will, God will bring every single evil to justice. Nothing will escape. There, God will say, any questions? And no, there will be no questions at the end of the final judgment because everyone will know and see how every single piece of evil has been brought to judgment. At the whole universe will be filled with a sense of justice, even those being condemned. You guys ever watch uh, like some movies or something about uh, there's, you know, the, the antagonist, the bad guy, and he's being chased, and, 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 and the good guys are chasing him, chasing him, and then uh, you're thinking, man, how's he going to get him? He's going to get away. He's going to get away. And then he kills somebody else, and you're like, oh, they, they got to catch him. And then 10 minutes before the movie ends, boom, they busted him. They get him down on the floor. They capture him, whatever. They beat him up. And you're inside you're like, yes! You guys know that feeling? Inside you're sitting like, I never thought it, would, it happened, you know, but it happened. And even though it's the same thing every time. <laughs> we all know how it's going to end. But every time we're just sitting there like cringing. That is exactly what the final judgment is, guys. Evil is just getting away in this life. But on the final judgment, that is what is happening is God is going to capture it finally busted down and says like Jesus will step into the world and slay the armies of Satan that is why we have the final judgment in order to satisfy the sense of justice that God has put into all of our hearts and last reason and get this this is important if God doesn't bring justice into the world he will be evil Imagine your best friend right now. Picture your best friend, whoever that may be. Now imagine somebody breaks in at night to their house and kills them, just murders. And not just like a quick death, a slow, painful one. And, and, and you're just outraged. And then finally, three months later, they catch the guy that did it. They bring him into court. And he says, I've got a kind heart. And the judge says, you do? And he says, yeah, really. And he lets him go. Guys, is that loving? Is that loving of the judge to do that? No, that is evil. That is an evil judge who did not bring justice to evil. And that is the same thing with God. If God does not bring justice into this world, he will be evil. But we know that God is good and there is no darkness in him. 
he will bring all evil to judgment. Guys, if, you, if there's ever people who ask you these questions, like, how's that fair? Why does God need to judge the world? You know, why can't he just let it go? Come on, God, get over it. Get over yourself. No, it's not about that, guys. It's about bringing justice into the world so that good may win. So that's final judgment. Hopefully you guys have a better grasp and a better understanding of it. You know, it's, where is it going to happen? Before the great white throne. When is it going to happen? When Jesus steps into this world, destroys evil. Who will be judged? Everyone. Believers, unbelievers. Everybody will be examined. Angels will be judged. Who will judge? Jesus and those who have trusted in Jesus. What will happen at the final judgment? Two steps. First one is the separation of everyone, deciding who goes where. And the second step is who gets what, wherever they go. And last one, why do we have the final judgment? And it's to show God's holiness and righteousness, God's mercy and grace. It is to satisfy that sense of justice that we all have. And lastly, it's to show that God is good. Amen? That is the final judgment. After that, we have the next topic, which is hell. And C.S. Lewis, awesome Christian writer, I am blessed by his writing all the time, I read it. He says this about hell. He says, there is no teaching which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this. Can you guys understand what he's saying? If it lay in my power, but it has the full support of Scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. C.S. Lewis, this guy that many Christians, many pastors look up to, is saying this thing. He's saying, if there's one teaching I could get rid of, I'd get rid of hell. But it has the full support of Scripture. Guys, the reality is, and if we're honest, emotionally, we don't want to believe in hell. Because hell is very scary and it's very difficult. And we don't want to believe in it. I don't want to preach about it because it's hard. I'm not enjoying this right now, guys. And if somebody enjoys the thought of someone else going to hell, then they've got something really twisted and sick in their minds and they have no awareness of their own sin and they're probably heading in that direction right now. We cannot, as sinful human beings, enjoy people going to hell. It says that God does not delight in the death of a sinner. God's not going to be rejoicing over the fact that He sent people into hell because says He does not delight in the death of a sinner. But just because it's emotionally hard doesn't change the reality. You guys remember Two Gun Crowley? How did he feel emotionally? Completely different. Did that change anything? Absolutely not. Let me give you another example. When I was in seventh grade, my grandfather was like this super healthy guy. Just, he's just always healthy, whatever he did. He rode a bike like at age 70. Awesome dude. One day, he just randomly died. It was like, it was like, it's like a truck just hit me off the road. I, did, I could not believe it. I was in shock. I loved him, but he died. And I remember for, for a period of time, I was so shocked emotionally that I couldn't believe in it. I thought, no, I'm going to go to his house right now. I'm going to step into his house, and he's going to be sitting exactly where he always sits in the kitchen. There's like this little table I could, I could still see. He sat in that corner always. But the reality is, he died. I never seen him after that, guys. Just because we, it's emotionally difficult to accept something doesn't change whether or not it's true. You guys agree with that? A lot of people, you'll, you'll be surprised, but a lot of people will actually argue this. They say, oh, you know, reality is in your mind and how you see it. No, it's not. I'm sorry to tell you that. How you think might change the way you act and the way you feel, but how you think cannot change permanently, at least fully, the outside world. If I just stop believing in this room right now, you guys are going to stare at me like, blinking, thinking, what is wrong with this guy? And while I'm going to be busy convincing myself that it's not real. Do you guys understand? Just because it's emotionally difficult doesn't mean it's not real. 
It has the full support of Scripture. Now, guys, as we look at the topic of hell, I want you guys to be aware of something that is called cognitive dissonance. Now, when you go to college, you learn what this word means, and it means that when we come across an idea or a thought or a situation or something that we that does not match what is inside of us, something that we don't like, some conflicting evidence, we tend to slip into cognitive dissonance. That means we push it away, we reject it, we deny it, we suppress it. You guys know what I mean, right? Something that we don't like, we just, you know, just fade away. You guys, and as we talk about hell, guys, I want to warn you, don't let cognitive dissonance set in because it's hard. It's easy for me to fall into cognitive dissonance as I'm preaching about this. It's easy for me to just say a bunch of words without actually giving it any sort of thought. This topic is so serious, it's so heavy that our natural reaction is to just check out. Guys, don't check out. Let us see what the Bible says about this. And for, for the topic of hell, I'm not going to do the five W's. Instead, I'll cover a few problems that people find with hell or with the idea of hell. These are things you're going to come across for a fact in your life as you talk to unbelievers. You guys ready? Keep these in mind. First one, and it's really obvious, but hell is real. A lot of people don't believe that. And I love, there's this, there's this quote by Dorothy Sayers. She's a, she was a Christian author. And she says this about the doctrine of hell. She, sees, she says, There seems to be a kind of conspiracy to forget, to conceal, where the doctrine of hell comes from. The doctrine of hell is not medieval priestcraft. And I'll explain that in a second. It is not medieval priestcraft for frightening people into giving money to the church. It is Christ's deliberate judgment on sin. We cannot reject hell without altogether rejecting Christ. Do you guys understand what she's saying? She's saying there seems to be like this common agreement between people and they say, well, hell was just made up by people, by governments and stuff to get you to donate your money to the church, to control you, to manipulate you. I had a uh, teacher in high school who says, oh yeah, and he was laughing about this whole topic of hell. He's saying like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, they, they made up this place. Like, you know, if you're going to be bad, you're going to go to that one place. But if you're good, you're going to go to the other place. Oh yeah, really smart of them. You know, people, I've been reading on the internet, people say like, yeah, before they couldn't control people, so they used fear of hell to manipulate tribes of people. The governments actually made up this topic of hell. Guys, the reality is that hell was not made up by governments or priests. Hell was brought to light to us by Christ. And He didn't have a kingdom in this world. The topic of hell has always been, people have always known about it since humans have ever walked in the world. Other religions, other cultures, they all have that. However, Christ is the one who spoke most about it. Christ is the one who brought most light to the topic of hell. Hell is real. And Christ did not have a motive, oh, I'm going to control these people. Guys, Jesus Christ was a homeless man who had no money and was killed by his own people at the age of 33. Do you guys understand that? Who did he have to manipulate there? He even said, my kingdom is not of this world. Can the topic of hell be abused and used to manipulate people? Absolutely. Is that what it is ultimately? Absolutely not. Because it comes from Christ. It is His deliberate judgment on sin. The next thing about hell is that it's eternal. Forever. Some people like to say, well, hell is not eternal because the Greek word that's used to say eternal, and this is Revelation chapter 14, verse 11 says, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. The Greek word that is translated from this forever and ever uh, I'm not going to give you the exact word, but the point is that they say, well, it doesn't actually mean without an end, but it means just a really, really, really long time, but eventually it will have an end. But we know that the Bible says that there will be no end to hell. Never stops. A million years into it, and you're not any closer to it being over. Why? Let me tell you guys this. It, the same Greek word that is used 
to describe the never-ending nature of hell is the same exact Greek word that is used to describe the never-ending nature of heaven. So if hell is not eternal, so is in heaven. Does that make sense? Hell is eternal, and that is what the Bible, the Word of God says. Hell is also a physical place. It says that people will be thrown there. And Revelation chapter 14, verse 10 says that they will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence. Notice the word choice. In the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Presence means physical. Right now I'm standing in your presence. You're sitting in my presence physically. It is a physical place. Hell is not just some, you know, some people like to say, well, hell is that, you know, that environment you create in yourself when you feel negative. When you feel angry at someone or you feel depressed or something, that is hell. Sorry, guys, that's not hell. That's just your sinful heart. Hell is much worse than that. Hell is a physical, real place where people, demons, Satan, will be thrown into it. Hell is also conscious. It's people will know that they're in a hell. A lot of people try to say that, oh, you know, like they're just going to go to hell, but they're not going to be conscious. Like their bodies will burn in there, but it, they're not going to feel anything. Or a lot of people say, why not just, you know, destroy people? Why not just, you know, here's a person that he sinned, and why be so cruel and send him into eternal punishment? Why not just like delete him, you know? You know, pull the plug on him. Let his screen go black. Why not do that? Why not just eliminate but I want to tell you guys this. Listen to this. You got to think about it. Stopping a problem is not the same thing as correcting it and bringing justice to it. Let me give you an example. Hitler killed millions of people, millions of Jews. Now imagine, you know, we know that Hitler killed himself, but imagine he didn't kill himself and he got captured finally by the Americans, the Russians. Everybody comes in, the allied forces, they capture him, and then he says, whoa, whoa, whoa stop, 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 stop. Wait, guys, wait, guys, wait. I promise I will be good for the rest of my life. I promise I will never hurt a fly after this. And they say, really? Okay. Go ahead, Hitler. Keep doing what you're doing. It's okay. Because you promised to stop. Now, let's assume that we knew for a fact that he would stop. For sure, 100%. We could believe that he will stop. Would that be just? No. Because stopping a problem, just stopping Hitler, is not the same thing as bringing justice to Hitler or to anyone else. I hope that makes sense, guys. And if you just pull someone's plug, if you turn their screen off, if you uh, make them go unconscious, just kind of erase them from the universe without bringing any sort of punishment, that is not justice. That is simply stopping the problem and not correcting it and not bringing justice to it, guys. We need, to be, we need to know these things. We need to know, have answers for these when people ask us. Because I guarantee you, somebody will ask you a question about this. Somebody will ask you when they find out that you believe in a real hell. They will ask you one of these questions. So I hope you guys are ready to give an answer to the glory of God. Jehovah Witnesses say that, you know, hell is just symbolic. But if hell is symbolic, so is heaven. I'm sorry. Let's be logical here. Chapter, Revelation chapter 14, verse 11 says, And the smoke of their torment, of their torment, goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. You guys know why they knock you out before you go to an operation? When, when you go, uh, go to a surgery? When you go to the dentist? You know why they knock you out? So that you wouldn't feel the pain. So that there would be no torment. When you're knocked out, there is no torment. But the Bible makes it very clear that it says, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Not the smoke of their unconsciousness, not their smoke of not feeling anything and not being aware that there's even smoke arising. It is the smoke of their torment, guys, forever and ever. That is the reality. This is what the Bible teaches us. Guys, this is what we believe. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ, it's not easy. But it's true. Next, there's the separation of all from all good. God is the giver of all good things. And in hell, there is no good. I remember another teacher. I've had a lot of teachers in high school who were atheists. He said, 
maybe you guys know Mr. Sanborn. He said, you know, I want to go to hell because that's where all the fun people are. That's a very, very wrong understanding of hell, guys. In hell, there's nothing good. There are no friendships. There's nothing good because God's not there. And God is the giver of all good things. And we know that God gives good things to all people on this earth. Even all the fun people that are sitting and going to hell, God is giving them good right now. And the only good that they're able to enjoy is the, art, is the good that God is giving us right now. In hell, there is no good. There, hell is not a party. Next, and this is going to be kind of hard to swallow, guys, but it says we know from the Word of God that hell is good, it is right, and it is just. Stay with me. You guys remember Tugan Crowley? You guys remember what he did? Do you guys remember how he felt about himself, that he was good and he would do nobody harm? The problem why we don't see hell as good and just, the problem why we see it as unjust, unfair, cruel, just evil, the problem, the reason people have problems with hell is not because of hell, but because we are all like two gun Crowley guys. We are all, in a sense, mentally ill. It's called sin. Sin blinds, sin twists our thinking. And because we have sin, we see our sin as good and we see God's righteous judgment as evil. Our view of this world and the universe and of God and His righteous judgment is perverted and twisted. So hell is actually good and right and just because it brings justice to the world. It fulfills the requirement of justice. But the reason we don't feel that way is because we are all like two gun Crowley. Think about that for a second. We might have not murdered someone, but we all feel the same exact way he felt about his sin. We all feel that about our own sins. And when people say, well, hell, that's just cruel. That right there is a sign, guys. It's called two gun Crowley syndrome let's call it that and it's real and we all have it and the more we our life is filled with God's truth the less of it we have and the more we see sin for what it is and the more we begin to appreciate God's final judgment now some people might say okay let's assume everything you said up to this point is true but how can eternal punishment be just okay this, this little kid stole some cookies from the cookie jar and he gets punished eternally. How is that fair? Okay, I, okay, I understand a million years. Okay, sure, a million years. Let's assume that's just. Let's assume that's fair. And then you get punished and uh, you're done. You know, they pull the plug on you. How is it fair, though, that eternally for something that people did, something small, not everyone's a murderer, not everyone's a rapist, yet everyone's going to get eternally punished. How is that fair? And in order to understand that, we need to understand this statement. The level of punishment that we receive, and also reward, the level of punishment is determined not just by what you do, you guys catch this, not by just what you do, but against whom you do it. Does that make sense? If you call your sibling a name, you might get a little punishment, maybe no punishment. If you call your parents that same exact name, you're going to get a higher level of punishment, maybe a smack on the back of your head, maybe worse. You did the same exact thing, but who you did it to changed the level of punishment. If you punch your little brother or you punch your sibling, you're going to get one level of punishment. You punch the president and you get shot on the spot. It's true. They'll kill you. You're a threat. It's not just what you do, it's not what we do, it's against who we do it to. And bringing, driving the point home, guys, sin is the rebellion, it is the hatred, it is the going against of the perfect, the eternal, patient, holy, loving Father and Creator. That is what sin is. Sin is not just, you know, taking a cookie from the cookie jar. 
Sin is that rebellion because behind that stealing of that cookie is actually a hatred of God's law, a hatred of the Creator and what He has told us how to live. Do you guys understand that? Sin is not just what it appears on the outside, but what is it behind and what does sin do to the Father's heart? A sin against the eternal God deserves eternal punishment. Because sin against God is not the same thing as sinning against the president or your little sibling. Because we're all sinful. We're all equal. And the difference between us in, re- in, rea- in reality compared to God is minimal. It's microscopic. But if you look at God and compare what that sin does against Him, eternal judgment, eternal punishment in that case makes sense. And that is why only Jesus Christ can pay for our sins because we have committed eternal sin and because He is the eternal Son of God. Only He can take that and pay for it, guys. So, and the last thing about hell as we finish up this topic is, and this is even harder to swallow, it's loving. I remember I was talking to some Jehovah Witnesses and they, you know, they started talking about that hell. They love to argue with you. They love to get into that. And they say, well, you know, God is love. How can God, how can God who is love punish people like that? That's not love. That's not love. When I want to tell you guys this. You know, when you just hear that, it's kind of tempting to believe that, right? Well, God is love. That makes sense. Why would God punish people if he's love? It's, it's a little tempting until you think about it a little bit deeper. That definition of love that the Jehovah Witnesses say is twisted. It's wrong. It's perverted. Let me explain this. When you assume that God won't punish people in hell because He's love, that means we have the wrong understanding of love. Imagine you come into this room and just pick you know, someone in, your, in this room who you love dearly, somebody you like, one of your closest people in this room. Just imagine them right now. Now imagine as you walk into youth service right now, you see a crowd of people standing right there by that door. And you run over there and you try to see what it is. And this person is nailed to the wall, guys. Do you, do, does that make sense? Imagine somebody nailed, physically nailed to the wall dying. Now, if you were to see that in real life, you would get post-traumatic stress disorder. You would have nightmares for the rest of your life seeing this person dying this awful death. And that's what happened to Jesus. 2,000 years ago, there's a man who was nailed to a piece of wood. We always hear about that. We always imagine this thing and, you know, we, we have this picture of the cross and stuff. But the reality is, if that's what it looked like, somebody you knew getting nailed to a wall groaning from pain and if you would have seen him a day before you wouldn't have been able to recognize him because all his body was just ripped up by those lashes guys that is just ugly and yet the bible tells us that the cross of christ and his resurrection is the greatest act and show of love in the universe does that make sense If we take the Jehovah Witnesses definition of love, you know that cute, fuzzy, cuddly, pink feeling? Then then the cross of Christ is not loving. But the Bible makes it really clear that God so loved the world. God's love is measured by by the cross. Everything else comes close. Everything is compared to that. And nothing compares to that. The cross of Christ was the most loving act in the history of the entire universe. It was ugly. Yes, it was ugly. It was not soft. It was not cuddly. It was not fuzzy. Yet it was the greatest act of love. So now let me ask you this question again. If the cross of Christ, a man being nailed to a piece of wood, if that is the greatest act of love, how hard is it to believe that hell is also loving. Does that make sense? Don't fall for these traps, guys. These people spend countless amounts of hours studying this, using little manipulative tactics to just divert people from the truth, guys. The reality, the Word of God is the truth, and it's all in here. All you got to do is study it. All you got to do is look into it. 
And I'm not just making something up for you guys right now. I'm just giving you the Word of God. The cross is central to the Word of God. And it says that the cross is the greatest loving act in the history of the entire universe. Hell is also loving. And if God lets evil go unpunished, that is unloving. Make sense? Remember, stopping a problem is not the same thing as correcting it, as bringing justice to it. And if God lets evil go, if he just says, okay, Hitler, if you promise not to touch anybody, we'll leave you alone, that is unloving. That is evil. Guys, hell is loving. And also the Bible says that hell was actually prepared for the devil and his angels. It was not prepared for human beings. And, God, and, and the Bible is clear that the gospel of salvation is offered to everyone. Everyone in this room, guys, if you're sitting in this room, the gospel, the way of salvation is open before you right now. It's right in front of you. You can't tell God that, oh, you know, you didn't try saving me. It's right here. It's right now, guys. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. We don't belong there, but the people that do not obey God will end up in there. So even though, finishing this topic of hell, even though it's clear that the, in the Bible, as we've seen, that it's good, it's right, it's just, and it's even loving, by saying these things, I'm not trying to say that hell is easy. I'm not trying to say that the top, like, you know, oh, hell's loving? Oh, oh. Whew. well, that makes things a lot easier. No, guys, hell is not easy. The topic of hell is not light. It's not all of a sudden cuddly and cute. Our hearts should be moved to repent and to proclaim the saving gospel to all the people. We must desire all people to be saved, no matter what they have done against us, because we're all sinners, and that's our default place to go. Only because of Christ we go to heaven, not because of our own righteousness. So the topic of hell is hard, but instead of closing our eyes to the topic of hell, guys, let's open our eyes to those who need to be saved out of it. Amen? Let us not do the other evil of closing our eyes to it. So that is hell. And the last topic is heaven. And I'm not ending this sermon on the topic of heaven just because I'm an optimist, which I am sometimes. I'm ending on this topic because heaven is the last topic that we find in the Bible. That's what the Bible closes with because God's an optimist. That's why I want to end with this topic of heaven. I'm not going to do the five W's of heaven. I'm not going to do the same thing I did with hell. Just a few things that we might misunderstand about it. First of all, guys, in the Bible it says, when John seen heaven, it says, he said, there's the new earth which God created and the new, he new heavens. And they came, the new heavens descended upon the new earth. Heaven is symbolic for, God, for God's living place, his house. Earth is symbolic for where we live. And heaven, the heaven where his children are going to go is the place where God and people live together. I know that God lives in me right now, but His presence, His physical, awesome, holy presence isn't here because we'd be all vaporized. We'd turn into dust. But in heaven, we get to see that because heaven is the joining of the new heavens and the new earth together. It's not just a floaty place where you just like float around playing on harps and on clouds. Guys, I would not want to go there, honestly. And thank God, thank you, Jesus, that that's not what heaven is because I suck at music and I can't play the harp. And it's going to take me an eternity to learn and I still won't get any better. So I'm not going to enjoy it. And thank God that's not what heaven is. Heaven is not this little boring place. Guys, heaven is not an eternal church service. Praise God, honestly. It's like we're not going to just sit there and sing all eternity until our vocal cords are just ripped up and destroyed and then we're going to listen to a boring preacher like this one right here with a monotone voice just droning on for eternity and eternity and eternity and flip your pages to the next verse no guys heaven is going to be awesome it is the presence of god it's not an eternal church service can we just say hallelujah to that honestly hallelujah yes thank you guys Hall amen uh, honestly guys just it's a relief for me to know that um, it's not an eternal church service. 
So we know that. Now next, uh, can I see a raise of hands? Who here has problems in their life? Okay, now if, can you keep your hands up? If you, now, for those of you who have a lot of problems, go ahead and raise your second hand. And now, if you're like me, and you've got even more than you can handle, go ahead and stand up, do a jumping jack. I'm just kidding, guys. Don't do that. I'm kidding about the jumping jacks. I'm not kidding about the amount of problems. Uh, the reality is, Revelations chapter 21, verse 4 says, speaking of God in heaven, he sa it says that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Guys, that's what heaven is going to be all about. God promises to get rid of all our problems. Literally, your specific problems that you're going through right now and that you will go through, God promises to finish them, to close everything, to get rid of that, package it and throw it away. And you will no longer have problems. I'm sure we all have this, that, you know, like, just think about your life, your general life, how you live, your day-to-day -day life. You know, one day you wake up, you get out of bed, and you're energetic, and you're ready. Uh, well, actually, maybe not everyone's energetic, because not everyone's a morning person. But, you get, you, whatever, you get out of bed, and you've got some strength in you. You know, I can do today. I can, I can get through today. I can do the things that I need to do. And you're kind of looking forward to the day. And then another day, you just you can barely crawl out of bed. You can just, you get out and you, you, you think about all the things you need to do. You think about all your problems and all you want to do is just you crawl back into bed, curl up into a ball and just cry your problems away. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's that fluctuation in our life that we have. One day we've got less problems, another day we've got more problems. The reality is, guys, God will change that. There will be none of that. Every day you're going to wake up and you're just going to be super happy. Even though you might hate mornings in this life, you're going to love them uh, in heaven. I guarantee you guys. I guarantee you, you will absolutely adore mornings because that is you waking up to see God once again, to worship Him, to honor Him, to be in His love and His presence. In heaven, guys, listen to this. In heaven, there will be no more sin. There will be no more fighting of sin. No more struggling. No more weakness. No more powerlessness. No more defeat. No more confusion. No more loss. No more lies. No jealousy. No hatred. No fear. No guilt. No shame. Nothing negative. That is what God promises us. Guys, that is an amazing, that is a beautiful promise of God. None of that will be there. Just a pure heart. A good mind. Godly desires. Strength. Grace. Peace. Truth. Honor. Integrity. Kindness. Love. Those are the only things that will be in heaven. No problems, only the good things of God. The Bible also says that there will be nothing accursed. Revelation chapter 22 verse 3 says, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb and of the Lamb will be in it and His servants will worship Him. You guys understand what this means? Accursed. At the end of the Bible, it says that heaven, nothing will be accursed. In the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, it says that everything was really good and nothing was also accursed until Adam sinned, until Adam and Eve sinned, and then God says, cursed is the world because of you. This life became cursed because of sin. So, let me give you an example of the curse. Think of anything negative in your life that you might not like, and any, by anything, I literally mean anything. For example, I hate standing in lines, guys. That's a curse. And there will be none of that in heaven. And I, I was thinking about it. The only two ways that that's not going to be in heaven is either there will be no lines or God will give me infinite amount of patience. And I'm fine with whatever one he does. So there will, even that's, you know, it's silly and it's funny, but the reality is there will be none of that. There will be no more frustration. You guys ever have that where you, you, uh, you know, you, you look at something and it looks really good and you're like, no, I'm just going to, I'm so hungry, I'm going to enjoy this right now. And you take a bite into it and it's the most disgusting thing you've ever tried. 
We all have that, right? That's negative. That's negative and that's bad. That's part of the curse. And there will be none of that in heaven. Even the littlest, simplest things, the smallest frustrations, the smallest little miscommunications, there will be none of that in heaven. Everything will be perfect. Nothing accursed. So actually, I want you guys to do this. As you go out through your day and as you uh, come across things that are negative, remind yourself that, hey, you know what? Heaven, the place I'm going, there's none of that. So go ahead and bother me with lines. Go ahead and bother me with nasty food. It's okay. It's not going to last for long. I'll keep eating you. <laughs> and the last one, not last one actually, second to last one is it says that we will rule with God. Can you guys just think about that for a second? We are down here. We are living in sin. God not only doesn't punish us, not only does this take us out of there, not, that's huge. We should be eternally grateful just for that, just for not punishing us. Instead, he brings us into his kingdom where there's nothing accursed. Wow, Jesus, thank you so much. And then he says, hey, you're going to actually rule with me. Let's see where the Bible says that. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. Jesus, as he sees John, he says, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. My throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Guys, our God is amazing. He doesn't just save us to use us as little slaves. Like, okay, you know, I saved you. Now you owe me for the rest of eternity. You know, you know, I washed your feet once. Go ahead and keep washing my feet for all of eternity. That's not who our God is. I know that's how we are. You know, you do one little good thing for people and then you expect them to keep repaying you for that good thing for the rest of their lives. We're all like that. We know that. But, 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 but I did this for you. That's not how God is. God is saying, I saved you. I paid for you. And I'm not, not only did I do that, but I'm going to have you sit on my throne, guys. And what this means is that God loves us and he's going to entrust us with different parts of his kingdom. That's beautiful, guys. If you guys enjoyed, you know, maybe there's something in your life that you really enjoy doing or you enjoy being responsible over something, well, God's going to give you a lot more. And you will do that for the glory of God and you will receive that joy. And the last thing, guys, and the most important one, and I'm out of water, the greatest one is the presence of God. Revelations chapter 21, verse 3. Listen to this, guys. Listen, we're almost done. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the living place of God is with man, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. That is just beautiful, guys. Just imagine your best friend, perfect lover, amazing father, like a loving mother, a great king who just loves to take care of his people. All of that combined in one does not even come close to who God is. And that is who God is and that is who we will be with for all of eternity. It's the most awesome person. You know, there's some people in this life and you just wish like, man, I just wish I could keep talking to this person, just keep spending time with them, just you know, absorbing their vibes from them. You guys know that people. There's like people that are really smart or they're really talented or they're, they, they, they've gone through a lot of an experience and you're like, man, I just wish I could just spend more time with them. God is that, but multiply by a billion and he's going to give us the pleasure of being in his presence forever. Revelation chapter 22 verse 4 says, they shall see his face. That means God will hide nothing from us. He will not cover his face, but he will show us the most personal, most amazing, most intimate part of his body, which is his face, his eyes. We will look into his eyes and not be ashamed. Psalm chapter 16, verse 11 says, 
David says about God, he says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In the presence of God there is a fullness of joy, guys. In his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 36, 9 says, For with you is the fountain of life. You know, there are things in this life, guys. When you see them, you're changed forever. You guys know what I'm talking about? And it could be either good or bad. For example, when we went to Yosemite in January, uh, in June, last June, uh, some of us here, we've seen a person, literally, person's life end. And when you see that, whether you like it or not, it changes you forever. You could do whatever you want, but just simply seeing something, being in the presence of something changes you. And it could be either bad or it can be good. You guys ever have that where you look at something so beautiful? You, you know, you look at a picture or you look at a mountain or a forest or an ocean or a sunset or a sunrise, anything beautiful. It doesn't have to be nature related. You just look at something beautiful and you're just, you can't stop looking at it. You're, you're just frozen. You're staring at it and you, and you don't want to look away because you're just, you're eating this picture with your eyes. You're drinking it from it with, with your eyes. You're just thirsty and you're looking at it. You guys know what I'm talking about? And it's the same thing with God, but multiplied by a billion. He is the most beautiful one ever. He is so beautiful that when you look into his face, you will be mesmerized. You will be hypnotized and just glued to him. And you're never going to want to look away anywhere else because nothing else is as good as God. And you will stand in his presence and feel his warmth and stare at him for all of eternity. And we're going to do other stuff as well, but somehow we're going to always see him as well. And he is the most beautiful one. You'll be so just busy looking at him, you're going to forget that you are you even exist guys that's how crazy it's gonna be even more the greatest guys the main point of heaven is that in it is the presence of God it is the face of God himself and then we those who have trusted in Christ those who have given up his sins and followed him we will all with all of God's people together in perfection looking at his astounding beauty, all of us will sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let's pray. Dad, I just ask that you would open my eyes to the realities that are in your word. I see them, but very slightly, God. I ask that you would open all of our eyes. God, you would, I ask that you would open our eyes to the reality of the final judgment, which is real and which we will all face. And I ask that you would open our eyes to the reality of hell and how it is good and just. God, even though we might not want to accept that emotionally, Father, and I ask that you would open our eyes to heaven, which you have promised to those who love you, God. Open our eyes and let us live with eternity in mind. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.